Everything's an instrument. You know, when you're making your tea in the morning and you, you like your little tea jar taps against it and you hear a little resonance and, you know, that's like you're creating sound art whether you know it or not. John was the one who said, you know, why don't we actually start a Los Angeles Free Music Society when it was really like three hippie weirdos. We thought it was hilarious because, you know, it was like a joke. But then, you know, when Tom and his friends, you know, like said, why don't we put out more records and put on some shows and we'll use that name. It basically wasn't real. It was something they made up. And there were enough of us to make it real. You kind of end up maybe dumbing it down sometimes and just saying we're an art and music collective. This was a brand new Epipho cheap Epiphone that I cut the neck on and put this fancy hinge on. I'm gonna fix it up and take it to Fender and propose that they market a Fender Bender. investigating what we can do with sound. And we sort of called it noise because at the time, if you called it music, people would get in an argument with you. People have told me they hear our records, especially our early ones, and they get this sense that these people are just doing whatever they want and they don't care whether you like it or not. You know, rock and roll records that we like, you know, like the jam records like Jimi Hendrix or Led Zeppelin, they just start to get to the interesting part and then they end because they're held down by, you know, the rhythm and the vocals and everything and, you know, just when it's starting to get good and you want it to take off into space, the record ends.
Hendrix has never sounded quite like this. I'm essentially sweetening the sound using tape, returning the audio that once lived on tape back to tape where it can live again. The sound of a backwards tape, people would freak out. Now you turn on the radio and there's reverse sounds on pop tunes and I'm really happy that sound has entered into the realm of, of music more. You probably couldn't really tell that I was actually manipulating tape, right? You just heard a musical performance. It's a nice little instrument. Of course, I put the LAFMS sticker on it to give it validity. This, one of my favorites. A friend of mine gave this to me. He had found it in a trash can in uh, East LA. It's a one string box. Just has a really a wonderful sound to it. For a long time, I could not look at a piece of wood without thinking of what musical potential it had. <laughs> I have a pocket trumpet that I have a, uh, a strange perversion of uh, putting a, uh, a bassoon uh, reed on it, and it has a, a rather hard to define sound. <laughs> Lots of times it would just be we'd just be playing stuff that was not any kind of traditional instrument. Thomas Schaum was a master of the lowest tech sort of homemade instrument. I think the most impressive one in terms of its low tech value was the nail shoe, which was a two by four, just whatever two by four and you pound a bunch of nails in it and, and and put a strap on it and you put the shoes on and then you walk kind of scrape around on concrete that was an instrument very dangerous thing to, to play sonically his most impressive instrument was undoubtedly the strungophone which is a, a two by four with a cymbal on it and then he would stretch a guitar string over it so it was nice and tight and then he would attach a bread bag clip and slip it onto the string and pull up on the string and then you would move the clip by pulling up on the string creating a vibration that sounded like Banshee's wail. Airway was a concept that Joe Potts came up with, and it's basically him playing subliminal voice tracks underneath uh, sort of a band playing just noise music. Anybody can plug into Airway but, you know, I'm, I'm at the control panel, so what comes out of Airway is what I want. You know, I, I've referred to it as electronic fascism. It's fucking loud. This was a wall of sound, and it was electronic, it was really loud, but I really like the concept because Joe had all these subliminals that he worked with. The infamous one was a Valentine's Day and I put a lot of love related things. The audience seemed to get extremely, extremely randy and attack Vetsa and attack Dennis like sexual assault territory. All of a sudden two guys came on stage and 
you know, I was a tiny little thing, and, and um, um, one grabbed me on either side and started just sort of bouncing me up and down. To the point where I, like, took my base and smacked someone across the head, and he had this little little cut here with a little drip of blood coming down his nose, and it was practically no stopping him. And when Joe told Betsa, well, I was putting porn images out through the, you know, or orgasm, sounds of orgasms, Betsa said, no, 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 <laughs> never again. So, uh, I got asked not to use those subliminals again. Those same instruments today might sound like this. This is Dennis Duck Goes Disco. This is the vinyl. He would take flexi discs and um, crumble them up and then um, flatten them out and play them. The first person that I ever played it for was Tom Rashawn. We sat in a parking lot in my car and I played it for him. And uh, he claims that he really loved it, so I'm going to take him at his word. That is an epiphany. That is an epiphany. Oh, hi. I'm Phyllis Diller. Welcome to my crib. Hi. I'm Mitchell Brown. Come on in, let's have some fun. Improvisation, you have to have a certain mindset. It's like a communion thing. You try and, you know, think with one mind. You have complete freedom, but you have to be listening. You have to be tuned into what's what's around you. I'm not a surfer, but I can imagine the first time you stand up on your board for two seconds that feeling hooks you, you know, so people are gonna keep going back out and trying to get a longer ride, and that's what improvisation was kind of like for me. I think we're really lucky to have found each other because there, um, there is a real sense of trust with each of us. Um, I'm getting a little choked up actually thinking about it because uh, there's been no pressure to force anyone to do anything other than the way they do it. And as it keeps unfolding, we keep coming together in new ways. Wow, that's pretty great, you know. I, I, I don't think there's many other organizations like it. 